physical examination of arteriovenous fistula. As we all know, arteriovenous fistula is the preferred axis and also remains the Achilles heel for dialysis patients. A good vascular axis is vitally important for adequate dialysis therapy. A well-functioning axis makes life easy for both the patient and the dialysis staff and hopefully the patient will not have to endure multiple sticks uh, to get a good dialysis treatment. 2006 KDOKI clinical practice guidelines states in its guideline number 4.1.1 access patency should be ensured before each treatment before any attempts to cannulate the access. Guideline 4.1.2 states all caregivers including fellows in training should learn and master the methods of examining a vascular access. I'm going to discuss primarily monitoring and surveillance as relevant to arteriovenous fistula. Primary failures account for 40 to 60 percent of fistulas created in the United States. The relevance of monitoring for new AV fistula helps in identifying primary non-maturing accesses. Secondly, monitoring helps in planning early interventions for those fistulas that are not maturing. And finally, planning for early surgical interventions or placement of new access in a timely manner to reduce the catheter duration. As far as established AV fistulas, early detection of problems helps in preventing thrombosis and preventing inadequate dialysis treatment on a chronic basis. Arteriovenous access is a continuous conduit. One should think of an arteriovenous fistula as a circuit that starts at the heart and ends at the heart. It is not just an anastomosis between an artery and a vein. As you can see in this animation, arteriovenous fistula is a continuous circuit. With each heartbeat, the blood is pumped from the heart into the arterial system of the extremity. It travels across the arteriovenous fistula, in this case it's the radiocephalic fistula at the wrist, into the venous system and returns to the heart and the cycle continues. It is important to recognize that for an arteriovenous fistula to function properly, all three components are necessary adequate sized vessels, a good anastomosis, and a good pump. A good physical examination helps in predicting the maturity of an AV fistula. A fistula that is at least 0.4 centimeters or greater and has a blood flow of 500 ml per minute or greater is likely to provide adequate dialysis almost 90 percent of the times. As you can see in this study, Fistulas with diameter of 0.4 centi centimeter or greater provided adequate dialysis in 89% of the cases. Fistulas with blood flow of 500 ml per minute provided adequate dialysis in 84% of the cases. And combining these two variables, 95% of the patients received adequate dialysis as compared to 33% who did not meet these criteria. Experienced dialysis nurse has an 80% accuracy rate in predicting the maturity of an AV fistula as was shown in this study. So a physical examination, a good physical examination can certainly help in identifying fistulas that are adequate for providing dialysis therapy. So what does one have to do to get a good physical examination? Three simple steps. Look, listen and feel. So what does one look for? First and foremost, it is necessary to identify the type of AV fistula. It helps in understanding the anatomy for proper cannulation of the axis. It also helps with standardized documentation in patients' medical records. So look for the surgical scar. Radiocephalic fistula or the forearm fistula is created at the wrist and is the preferred first axis. The upper arm fistula can be either brachiocephalic or 
transposed basilic vein fistula. The brachiocephalic fistula has a horizontal scar in the elbow crease, whereas the transposed basilic vein fistula has a long scar extending from, from the axilla to the elbow on the medial aspect of the arm. This slide shows the radiocephalic fistula. In the schematic picture on the right hand side of the slide, the scar at the wrist is shown in the enlarged insert with an end to side anastomosis between the forearm cephalic vein and the radial artery. The brachiocephalic fistula is in the upper arm. The cephalic vein runs along the lateral aspect of the arm. The schematic picture here shows the scar along the elbow crease with the insert showing the end to side anastomosis between the upper arm cephalic vein and brachial artery. The basilic vein is the deep vein in the upper arm that is located between the two heads of biceps muscle. The vein is transposed into a superficial tunnel for easy cannulation during dialysis. The schematic diagram shows the long scar that extends from the axilla to the elbow and an end to side anastomosis between the transposed basilic vein and the brachial artery. The magnified insert shows the swing site that is the point where the basilic vein is mobilized from its deeper tissues to the superficial tunnel. Innovative surgeries and complex scars can give an idea about the type of unconventional fistulas. Here you can see a long scar in the forearm that extends from the wrist to the elbow. The forearm cephalic vein has been mobilized in a loop configuration and anastomosed to the brachial artery at the elbow. The loop configuration looks similar to an arteriovenous graft, but unlike the looped graft, the surgical scar is long and extends all along the entire length of the forearm. It is important to differentiate between a loop graft and a loop AV fistula because the cannulation techniques are different. Here you can see an, a transposed forearm basilic vein fistula. The basilic vein runs along the medial and posterior aspect of the forearm. It is mobilized to the anterior or the volar surface of the forearm and anastomosed to the radial artery at the wrist. The picture on the top shows a well-developed forearm transposed basilic vein fistula. The picture on the bottom shows the scar on the posterior medial aspect of the forearm. Signs of inflammation. Redness and rash over the fistula outflow tract could suggest inf infection or inflammation. Early diagnosis can help prevent bacteremia and its associated catastrophic complications such as cellulitis and sepsis. As you can see in this picture on the left, angry red buttonhole sites are, are suggestive of possible cellulitis and one should avoid cannulating the fistula through these buttonholes. This needs to be treated appropriately before accessing this fistula for dialysis treatment. The picture on the right shows a forearm with rash which could be from infection, could be from local irritations or allergies to dis skin disinfectant or allergies to tape. Aneurysms are frequently seen on the fistula arm. Aneurysms develop because of trauma from cannulating the same site or due to a significant proximal stenosis in the outflow tract. It is important to note the size of the aneurysm. Also, the skin over the aneurysm needs to be inspected for thinning or depigmentation. Paper-thin, shiny skin over an aneurysm is a warning sign for potential rupture. Rupture of an aneurysm can lead to disastrous outcome including loss of limb or death. The picture on the right shows a large hematoma in a forearm axis. The hematoma could be secondary to infiltration 
from bad uh, cannulation techniques. Hematoma can develop easily in patients who are on chronic anticoagulation therapy. Poor cannulation technique can often lead to large hematomas, large infiltrations, and sometimes even loss of the dialysis axis. Providing proper education and training to the dialysis staff can reduce the incidence of such uh, uh, clinical side effects of uh, infiltration. Arm elevation is a simple test to diagnose outflow obstruction. In the absence of outflow obstruction, the fistula collapses completely on arm elevation. So a normal outflow, the fistula should collapse with arm elevation. In the presence of obstruction, the portion of fistula distal to the obstruction remains distended while the portion proximal to the obstruction or stenosis collapses completely on arm elevation. In this video clip, the arm with the radiocephalic fistula is seen in the horizontal position. There is a small aneurysm at the wrist that is distended when the arm is in horizontal position. The fistula collapses or the aneurysm flattens out completely as you can see here when the arm is raised and again when the arm is lowered and made horizontal the aneurysm fills up, the fistula fills up and it appears distended. Thus in the absence of outflow obstruction as you can see clearly the distended fistula collapses completely. It's a very simple test it does not take more than a few seconds. Inspection for central vein stenosis. Central vein stenosis is seen in patients who have received multiple central vein catheters or have endovascular leads from a cardiac rhythm device. Central vein stenosis leads to swelling of the entire extremity as seen in the picture on the left. It also leads to development of collateral veins along the pectoral and shoulder regions as seen in the picture on the right. The picture on the left shows the swollen right upper extremity when compared to the left. The picture on the right shows again the collateral veins that have appeared in the axillary and pectoral regions in a patient with a transposed basilic vein fistula. Steele syndrome may lead to peripheral cyanosis. The hand and fingers get cold and blue as seen here in the picture on the left. The picture on the right compares a normally perfused pink hand to a cyanosed hand in a person with uh, steel syndrome. Steel syndrome is common with upper arm fistulas compared to forearm fistulas and is frequently seen in elderly patients patients with peripheral arterial disease which may be related to smoking or diabetes. Moving on to palpation of the fistula. Palpation involves assessment of the inflow, assessment of the outflow and assessment for accessory veins. Juxtanastomotic venous stenosis. This is the most common site for venous stenosis. Juxtanastomotic means close to the anastomosis. That's the site where there is surgical mobilization of the vein and this mobilization leads to small trauma or ischemia of the vein. Early diagnosis by palpation of the anastomosis and the distal outflow vein helps in, 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 in treating these uh, stenotic lesions. Normally, a very prominent thrill is present at the anastomosis and fistula is soft and easily compressible. With juxtaanastomotic stenosis, a water hammer pulse is felt at the anastomosis. A water hammer pulse is a very forceful pulse that is felt at the anastomosis. The pulse goes away rather abruptly as the site of stenosis is encountered. Above this level, 
the pulse is very weak and the vein is poorly developed. Assessing strength of arterial flow or arterial inflow. A normal fistula is not pulsatile. It is very soft and compressible. With occlusion of the outflow, it becomes very pulsatile. The strength of the pulse is directly proportional to the arterial inflow pressure. And this assessment of inflow is what we call augmentation of the fistula or augmentation of arterial inflow. The augmentation test. The augmentation test is performed to assess the adequacy of inflow pressures. The animation clip shows the radiocephalic fistula. The first part of the animation shows a normal augmentation test. The outflow vein is manually occluded few centimeters proximal to the anastomosis. The segment between the arterial anastomosis and the occlusion becomes hyperpulsatile because of the arterial pressures transmitted across the patent anastomosis. The second part of the animation shows the stenosis in the inflow segment. The arterial pressure is not adequately transmitted and the segment between the occlusion and the anastomosis remains weakly pulsatile. Again the panel on the left shows hyperpulsatile segment with manual occlusion of the outflow suggestive of a widely patent inflow segment. The panel on the right shows weak or poor augmentation of the inflow with manual occlusion suggesting of inflow stenosis. Venous stenosis in the outflow track. Outflow venous stenosis leads to forcibly pulsatile and firm segment distal to the stenosis. The distal segment enlarges rapidly often taking an aneurysmal or near aneurysmal proportions. There is absence of thrill distal to the outflow stenosis. All this will be seen over the next two slides uh, to make these points clear. Absence of thrill with outflow obstruction or stenosis. A normal fistula is soft and compressible and has continuous soft thrill. With outflow stenosis, the fistula becomes pulsatile, firm and loses the thrill. The animation video clip shows the radiocephalic fistula. The first part of the animation shows the continuous thrill that can be appreciated all along the outflow tract. The second part of the animation shows absence of thrill distal to the stenosis. This distal segment becomes firm, does not collapse with arm elevation and as you can see there is no thrill. Again the panel on the left shows normal continuous thrill along the entire outflow tract. The panel on the right shows absence of thrill in the segment distal to the stenosis. The pulse proximal to the stenosis becomes weak. Hyperpulsatile fistula with outflow stenosis. A normal fistula is soft and compressible and has a soft continuous thrill. With outflow stenosis, the fistula becomes hyperpulsatile and firm. As you can see in this animation clip, the radiocephalic fistula with inflow through the radial artery, outflow through the cephalic vein. The first part of the, fish of the animation shows the continuous soft pulse all along the outflow cephalic vein. The second part of the animation will show stenosis in the outflow tract and distal to the stenosis the segment of the fistula becomes hyperpulsatile. This, this segment, distal segment is firm and as you can see has a very strong pulse because of the transmitted arterial pressure through the anastomosis. Again the panel on the left shows normal soft pulsations transmitted all along the outflow tract. The panel on the right shows stenosis and distal to the stenosis the segment is hyperpulsatile. Accessory veins sometimes prevent maturation of a fistula. The accessory veins especially in the juxtaanastomotic segment that is the segment closer to the anastomosis in the outflow tract can lead to loss of pressure head into the main 
channel that is used for cannulation. Normally on examination, the thrill that is palpable over the arterial anastomosis disappears completely when the downstream or the outflow of the fistula is manually occluded. If the thrill does not disappear with manual occlusion of the outflow, then one should suspect an, an extra channel or an extra outflow channel that we call an accessory vein which may be present between the anastomosis and the point of occlusion. Accessory veins lead to sometimes poor or failure of maturation of arteriovenous fistula. As you can see in this animation clip, the radiocephalic fistula, we zoom in to the radiocephalic anastomosis and in a normal radiocephalic fistula with occlusion of the outflow and the normal inflow, the segment between the anastomosis and the occlusion, there is absolutely no thrill that can be appreciated. The thrill disappears completely with occlusion of the outflow. In the presence of an accessory vein, despite occlusion, the thrill persists, especially if the accessory vein is large. As you can see here, the segment between the occlusion and the anastomosis, there is persistent thrill. Again, in the left-hand side panel, with a normal fistula, occlusion leads to absence of thrill. In the right-hand panel, in the presence of accessory vein, despite occlusion, the thrill persists. Sleeves up for arteriovenous graft. This is a very important test for every patient who has an arteriovenous graft. Grafts do not tend to stay open forever and especially in patients who have a good upper arm vessels, it's, it's necessary to check for the presence of dilated veins in the upper arm that can be used subsequently for an arteriovenous fistula creation. So it's vitally important that every patient who has a forearm AV graft should have a routine sleeves up examination of the upper arm. As you can see in this patient, the upper arm cephalic vein has nicely developed. So in future, when the AV graft fails, the upper arm cephalic vein can be utilized for conversion to an arteriovenous fistula. So we move on to auscultation or the listen part of physical examination. You need to listen to the entire axis arm, so not just at the anastomosis or not just at the cannulation site. One should auscultate from the anastomosis all the way to the chest. There might be stenosis or abnormal findings all along the outflow tract. This is how a normal brui, which is soft, continuous, both during the systolic and diastolic phase of the cardiac cycle, is heard over the anastomosis as well as along the outflow tract, uh, mainly over the cannulation se segments. In the, in the presence of stenosis, the sound becomes high-pitched as you can hear here. More mistakes are made from want of proper examination than for any other reasons. Thank you very much for your attention.